Hi everyone, and welcome to Area 10 Faith Community Online. My name is Tim Davidson, and I'm one of the elders here at Area 10. I have a few things I want to let you know before we get started with our service. First, if you're looking for ways to stay connected, you can go to area10church.com slash now for more information about what's happening at Area 10. You can also download a coloring page related to this week's message for anyone at home who loves to color. Another way we worship together as a church family is by giving back some of the money we earn to Area 10. This helps us to transform lives in the city for the city. You can give through our website at area10church.com slash give or through the Area 10 app. All you need to do is open the app, click the give icon, enter the amount you'd like to give and press submit. If you haven't given this way before, the app will walk you through the rest of the steps. It's like a virtual popcorn bucket. Let us know you're watching. You could fill out our digital connect card in the Area 10 app or by going to area10church.com slash connect. Especially if you found Area 10 recently. We would love to connect with you this week. Now our worship band is going to lead us in a couple of songs. So feel free to sit, stand, or worship however you feel comfortable in your own home. Let's get started.
Hey, Area 10, really glad to be with you and glad you are joining us this morning as we worship together. Uh, I, I want to talk today about the idea of these moments of transition or these, these ceremonies that we go through. So for a lot of people right now, they would have been going through a graduation ceremony, and I've seen people get really creative on how to do that, but a graduation ceremony is, hey, we're getting a bunch of people together to celebrate that you, have, you are transitioning and you are finishing this 
phase of life and you are moving into this new thing. So we, we are used to the idea that we have a ceremony to mark the end of something. We also have some, sometimes we have a ceremony to start something, when we initiate something. So uh, think about initiation ceremonies that people have it, to get into a fraternity or sorority. Some of you did that. I did not live the Greek life. There are not, there's no Greek life at small Bible colleges. But you're familiar with the idea that sometimes there are these ceremonies that we go through that are these moments of initiation that, that sort of bring us into a new thing. And in Christianity, we have something actually very similar to that. When Jesus taught, he taught about the kingdom of God. He taught about this idea that there's an unseen kingdom in the world, and that he was bringing that about on earth, and he was sort of ushering in this new age, and that all, all of us are invited in, in, to, to have, and we're given an opportunity to be in relationship with God through Jesus. And so there's an initiation that happens to get into the kingdom, and that initiation that Jesus himself went through, and then all of his followers eventually went through, and that we go through all the way up to, until today, that initiation kind of ritual or ceremony is, is called baptism. So today I want to talk about baptism because we're in this series called The Unstoppable Force, and we're talking about what the church is. And one of the unique things that a church does is that we baptize people, and it's actually a powerful thing and it's an important thing. And I want to talk about what it is, what it does, and why it matters. And specifically, for those of you who have been baptized, I want to talk about why it should matter very much right now in all of the stuff that we're seeing going on in our culture. Um, our baptism is also important in this moment. So let me give you a little history of baptism before we jump into where, it, where it's talked about in the scriptures. In the first century, the Jews were used to the idea that you would enter water to become clean, like a bath or like ceremonially clean. So in the ancient world, they don't bathe as much as we do, but they still had this idea that if I'm going to be in front of God, if I'm going to go in the temple or the synagogue or something like that, I'm going to enter into a, a, a sort of baptism. I'm going to enter into this water to become clean. They actually use something. We'll put a picture of it up on the screen for you. They, they have these little pools, and you can find these all over Israel now in archaeological digs. They're called mikveh's. And it's a little hollowed out space where they'd have water in. And if you were going to approach the temple in Jerusalem, for example, you would go through these mikveh, you'd walk through them and, and you'd become clean. You'd put on a robe and then you'd walk up the steps into the temple. Archaeological digs in Jerusalem show there's, there's tons of them, hundreds of them on the side of the temple area where people would go through, you'd enter this water. Now, in Jewish thought, then that, that, that baptism, that cleansing was, I go down into the water and I come out and now I am clean before God. I, I, I sort of, in a sense, I make myself clean. We, we do something similar. We call it taking a shower. Probably some of you remember what that's like from before COVID. When you were going out of the house, we would like take showers. And, uh, or if you're going to go on a date or something, go to work. When we used to go to work, like you take showers, right? You, you get clean. Well, they would do something similar but it wasn't just physically clean, removing dirt from the body. It was ceremonially clean. I am, I am now standing cleansed before God, that kind of idea. But Jews typically did that to themselves. You go into the water and you were made clean. Something changed when Jesus enters the scene. Right before Jesus comes onto the scene, his cousin starts preaching. His cousin's name is John the Baptist. He was called the Baptist because he dunked people in water. He did that ritual ceremonial cleansing thing, but he did it in a different way. Normally, people would walk into the water themselves. With this, people came to John. He stood in the Jordan River. They walked up to him. He took them, and he put them under the water, and someone was doing it to you in a sense. And he baptized people and said, this is for repentance. This is for you turning back to God. And, and it was a bizarre thing. It was so bizarre that people traveled around from miles and miles to go see this guy baptizing. They called him John the Baptist or the dunker or the dipper or something like that. John, the guy who puts people underwater. This is really weird. Um, it's written about in the book of, uh, of Mark, John, chapter one. Let me just read it to you. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. 
And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, Mark lets us know that John the Baptist is a pretty weird dude. He's got weird clothing. He's eating strange things. He's just, you just, this kind of wild haired prophet guy hanging out in the wilderness. And people are so blown away, not just that he's weird, but they're blown away by his message of come be baptized for repentance and like get yourself right with God. And then he's also saying, hey, there's someone coming after me. He's kind of setting the stage for Jesus to to come onto the scene. He's saying, um, sort of foreshadowing that and saying, I'm not not even worthy of the guy who's about to come and talk to you. So people are coming from all over the place to meet with him. Eventually, Jesus comes to him and Jesus is baptized by John. And and God speaks in that moment. It's this powerful thing. Jesus is baptized to start off his ministry. And then Jesus goes and does all the Jesus things you've ever heard Jesus doing. He goes and he preaches. He uh, heals people. He heals lepers. He raises people from the dead. He feeds the 5,000. He turns water into wine. He does all of these things that are recorded in the gospels for three years. And then he dies. He's crucified on a cross. Um, And then he resurrects from the dead, comes back from the dead. And before he leaves, he speaks to his closest followers, his disciples. And he wants them to continue on the kingdom work that he started. And listen to where baptism shows up in this. This is what he tells them before he leaves. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus, his his parting words, his final instructions is about spreading the news of the kingdom. It's about making disciples. That's what he's called to do. That's what we as a church are called to do. That's what we as followers of Jesus are called to do. We are called to make disciples. This is Jesus' commissioning ceremony. And and he says, go make disciples. And, and, And notice what he says, baptize them. This is the start. This is the initiation point. You baptize them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I want you to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So baptism isn't something you do to obey what he's commanded you later on. That'll come. It's part of the initiation ceremony. You are coming to Christ. You are going to be baptized. This is what Jesus tells people to do. And you see this pattern of people coming to Christ and then getting baptized. You see that show up in the early church. Uh, 50 days after after this, uh, Jesus uh, appears to the disciples, or the Spirit of God appears to the disciples as they are waiting in, uh, in, in, recorded in the book of Acts, they're waiting in Jerusalem for God to do something. The Holy Spirit enters the room while the disciples are all there praying together, and it says like there's these tongues of fire that land on the different disciples that are in there. I don't know what you think of when you think of tongues of fire. I think of the like the, the, the closing scene of Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, that like weirdness of like things coming out of the ark and like that melted people's faces off. This is a little different. Uh, it's, it's more of a good thing. Um, but it's, it's a weird image that, that the, the spirit is, shows up in this visible way and a- arrives on these people and these guys in the upper room in Jerusalem. And then a crazy thing happens. They start talking and a crowd gathers because they heard a bunch of noise these guys start talking in their native language and the crowd who are is made up of people of all different languages they hear these guys talking in their own language so they would speak like we would speak english but if you were a spanish speaker you would hear it in spanish and this was a gift god was using uh this gift of tongues he was using it so that these these guys could could actually go to the ends of the earth and tell people about Jesus that he, God was letting them know right up front hey I will cover the language barrier this is going to could to be okay God was like pulling the original Google translate except it was accurate and worked all the time um and so God does this and so Peter stands up to preach to the entire crowd and gives them this long sermon, the book of Acts chapter two. We'll read through it. We're gonna read through the book of Acts next year. We'll we'll go into it then. But he gives this whole sermon of the history of Israel and says to this entire crowd who had just seen um, Jesus crucified, 
just a, a few weeks earlier, um, he says to the crowd at the end of this, hey, you guys killed Jesus. You were here. You killed Jesus. And listen to their response recorded in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. This is what the crowd says. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. All right, so Peter says, you guys killed Jesus. And the crowd goes, oh man, that's, this is bad. What have we done? And it, and it says they were, they, were, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted about this. And they said, what do we need to do about it? This is where I think it gets personal for you and I. For us to come to Jesus, we have to start by saying, oh, wait a second, I've blown it. Now, for them, it was obvious. They remember Jesus being crucified. You weren't there. I wasn't there. But we've blown it, all of us. And that's a starting point for getting right with God. We start by going, yeah, I've sinned. I've, I've messed up. No matter what moral code or moral standard you have, you say, oh, I believe in these things. I try to live by these values and ethics. You know, right? You know this about you, and I know this about me, that we've blown it. It doesn't matter what your standard is. You have not lived up to it. All of us have, are in that same position. We know there are good things to do and bad things to do, and sometimes we've done bad things. We know there are right things and wrong things, and sometimes we've done wrong things. We know this about ourselves. And really what we feel about that is we feel guilty. We feel guilty about it. We're like, ugh, this is, I, I've messed up. Um, and, and, and we feel horrible about it. Um, and, and so the solution... Uh, is, is first to get honest with God about it and just say, God, I've blown it. I've messed up. I, I, I need to make th things right. And I think the reason that's the solution is because if we're going to come to God, we need to come to him honestly with no pretense. Don't pretend you're better than you are. Just come to him and say, look, I've, I've blown it. Um, I, I need to do something. Peter's response to them is two things. He says, okay, you feel, you feel that sense of guilt. You know you've sinned. You know you've messed up. Here's what you do. Number one, you repent he says, repent. The word repent means to turn away from or basically do a 180 from the road that you were on. So the bad stuff you were doing, stop doing it. Like walk a different direction. Don't continue to, to, to go there. Now, that's not easy. It, it, it doesn't happen all at once or all overnight. Um, there are times when we're not aware of things as sin. And so we find out about them and we're supposed to repent of those as well. Um, but the starting point is, hey, um, I've messed up and I'm, and I'm going to walk away from those things. I'm not going to continue to do those same sins. Um, so you need to ask yourself the question, what does repentance look like in my life? What, and this is a question we ask people when they're going to get baptized. What does repentance look like for you? W what are you walking away from right now? Are, are you aware of your sin and are you willing to walk away from it? That's where we start. So he says, repent. And then he says, be baptized. So baptism, uh, this idea of immersing people in water, dunking them in a, a river or a water tank or, or whatever it is, um, you're going to get immersed in water. And then he says two things are going to happen. One, your sins will be forgiven. And two, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's break that, that down briefly. Um, first of all, when we are baptized, our sins are forgiven. I think one of the biggest challenges we have as humans uh, with sin is that we either, I, I think if we're honest, we all know we're sinners, but, but really the, the, the challenge is we feel very guilty about it. We feel guilty and we feel ashamed. So guilt is I did something wrong. And then shame is like perpetual guilt. Shame is like, um, I feel terrible because I'm a bad person. You know, guilt would be, I did something bad. Shame would be, I'm a bad person. And it becomes sort of a chronic guilt situation. And a lot of us deal with that pretty regularly. 
I feel guilty, I feel ashamed, I'm not who I say I am, or I'm a hypocrite, or I'm, I'm broken, or, or all, all of those things that we kind of feel, and that guilt sort of piles up. And this is true whether you're religious or not. Everybody feels it to some degree. And so what we do about that in, in sort of pop psychology is we say things like, well, if you feel guilty, you feel ashamed, you do you, just live your own truth. You need to feel good about yourself. Um, you know, take care of yourself. We talk about self-care. We, t- we say you need to meditate. Your, your sins, the things you've committed, the things you've done wrong, it's not a big deal. It's not a big problem. You just need to get right with you. Um, and, and, I, and I understand why we say that. And, and I'm a fan of taking care of you. <laughs> I'm a fan of, of self-care things. I'm a fan of meditation. I'm a fan, I'm a fan of these things. But we need to understand something. Um, no amount of you feeling good about you is going to take away your guilt. You can, you can because when you sin, uh, you're not just sinning against you. You're sinning against someone else, and you're sinning against God. There's a, there's a bigger issue there. And so you can't forgive you. That's not something Scripture even calls us to do. Um, you have to make things right with other broken relationships. So if you, if you cheat on someone... You can't just be like, well, I've forgiven me and I feel better about that. No, you have a broken relationship with that person. And because that person is a child of God, you now have a broken relationship with God because you sinned against that person. Does that make sense? I mean, think about it. If you sin against my children, you have now sinned against me. It's, it's, it's that simple. And when you sin against a, a son or daughter of God, you are sinning against God himself. And so no amount of you just meditating or, or feeling better about yourself or like thinking good thoughts is going to make that right. Um, you have to be, to be cleansed and, and you have to get forgiveness ultimately from God. You may never get forgiveness from the person you've sinned against. They may never choose to forgive you, but you can come to God and say, God, will you make me clean? God, will you wipe this away? And this is what happens in baptism. When you get baptized, all of those sins, all the things that you've done and, and, and will do, that stuff is wiped away and God looks at you as cleansed and, and he looks at you as, as, as righteous. Um, the guilt and shame is, is wiped away and you don't have to go through your life with it around your neck because if guilt and shame hang around your neck and you are never cleansed, you are never healed, typically what people do is throw anything at those things to make themselves feel better, to, to numb that pain. We, people go to drugs and porn and overeating and codependency and, and all of this kind of stuff with hopes that it will make the guilty stuff feel better, and it doesn't. It usually just makes those things worse. The way to be free is to become a disciple of Jesus, and the way to become a disciple of Jesus is to enter into that initiation of being baptized into him. So Peter says that if we're baptized, our sins will be forgiven. But he also says we will receive the gift of, of the Holy Spirit, which is a, 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 a powerful thing. This is the, the pattern that you see in the book of Acts of people coming to Christ. They get the Holy Spirit and God's Spirit starts to work in their lives. Yes, it was unusual, the tongues of fire thing that happened to the apostles. But from that point forward, when people came to Christ, uh, they, they received the Holy Spirit when they were, they were baptized. And you see that through some of the different conversion accounts in, in the book of Acts. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a powerful thing. That is sort of the, that is the general pattern of how it works. Not every single time, but that's generally how it works. People are baptized and the Spirit comes upon them. So this kicks up a couple questions that I want to address for us uh, around baptism. Number one is, because um, you may hear this, and you know, you can text in questions uh, if you have questions about this. Uh, we've put the number up on the screen. You can text in questions because usually when you talk baptism in the church, people have lots of opinions and lots of questions. And I want to tackle them if you have them um, but w- so we can, we can talk about that. But there's a couple questions that let me just try to address uh, here up front that I hope are helpful to you. Um, one question would be, who are the people who should be getting baptized? Um, because... A lot of people will say, hey, I was baptized when I was a baby. And then people will be like, does that count, right? Like, is that good enough? Did I do the thing? Um, And I understand why people say that. And I understand really where baptism of babies came from and why people do it. Um, I guess what I would say is, when you see in the book of Acts that baptism is paired with repentance, and really that baptism is an expression of faith, 
I would just challenge you to think through, can a baby repent (laughs) or have faith? No, right? The baptism that you had as a baby was something your parents did for you as their commitment that they're going to raise you to know the Lord, which is a good thing, and we should thank them for it. But it's not the same as Christian baptism in the New Testament. By and large, the baptisms that you see in the New Testament are of people who are old enough to understand what they're doing and who are making a faith commitment to Jesus. There is an example of someone's entire household being baptized. We don't know how old they all were. But generally what you see is that people are making this commitment to follow Jesus and, and give their lives to him. Um, and, and, and that doesn't really work with an infant. So if you were baptized at a very, very young age and, and you've not been baptized since then, I would say, yeah, get baptized now. Like, why, why not? Why not do the thing Jesus modeled, Jesus commanded, the early church did and, 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 and taught for the last couple of millennia, just do the thing that we're called to do. Be, be baptized into Christ, even if you were baptized at a very, very young age and didn't know what you were doing. That isn't to say, you know, if you were baptized at age 10 and you had some clue, that, fine, right? Like, even as adults, when we get baptized, we're not aware of everything we're about to get into in the kingdom of God. I understand that. But if you were an infant, um, consider that maybe, no, you should get baptized as an adult, making that commitment on your own, uh, uh, of your own free will, uh, as, as, a, as a response of faith in Christ. Um, the second issue that sometimes is brought up are for people, and you may be one of them right now, you go, hey, Chris, I've been a Christian for years, but I've never been baptized. Uh, what, so what do you do with that? I'm, I'm following God. I've been following God for decades. I, I haven't been baptized. Why would I get baptized now? And some people get like, man, if I got baptized now, that, that means I'm kind of saying I wasn't a Christian before. I don't think you need to get hung up on all that. I guess what I would say is the idea that you are a Christian and you would say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I haven't been baptized. That idea is pretty foreign to the New Testament. People who became Christians got baptized. There wasn't this like, hey, I'm a Christian and I haven't been baptized. I can think of maybe one instance of something like that in the book of Acts chapter 18, where there was someone who was following Jesus but hadn't yet been baptized. And then they just went ahead and got baptized once they realized, oh, I should do that. So um, I, I, I would say that isn't normal in Christian history that people are claiming Christ but haven't been baptized. And I guess I would just say, well, just do it. Like, what, what's stopping you? What, um, it, it, it's, it's okay. Why not get baptized? And you don't have to have, like, to be baptized. Uh, it doesn't have to be, oh, my, all of my sisters and brothers and cousins were there, and I'm going to schedule it the day my mom can be here and all that. Like, you don't have to do it that way. We could baptize you this week, you and, you know, two people or something in, 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 in the baptismal uh, tub that we have here at 2810, or we could go down to the river or something. Like, it doesn't have to be um, this massive public thing. That being said, let me give you an opportunity. Next Sunday, June 28th, after church, we're going to baptize people in the James River. I want to put that out there. Uh, the James River has seen plenty of sins washed away. Some of them are still in there probably. It's, it's a weird thing. Um, but you can be baptized there. We, we, uh, we want to get together. It's outdoors. It's great, uh, a, a great spot to be. We'll, we'll, we'll pick a spot out and we'll come together and baptize people. We have baptized a lot of people in the James River over the years. I've even done it in January. I don't recommend it, but it's happened. Uh, so, so yeah, let's go next Sunday. If you've not been baptized, here's what I want you to do. On your connection card, on the Area 10 Church, the Connect card that we have, um, just check on there that you're interested in baptism, and we will get in touch with you this week, and we'll talk about it with you. Uh, there's a form you can fill out on our website. We'll walk it through with you, and let's just have a celebration next week. I haven't seen a lot of you in a while, and it would be good to come together anyway just to celebrate what God is doing and celebrate this initiation into the kingdom of, of, of new people uh, and of people saying, I, I want in on that too. Uh, that's be, this would be a powerful thing. I want, I want you to remember that baptism is, is less like a finish line than it is like a starting line. Some people get really hung up and they go like, man, uh, I, I want to get baptized, but I need to clean things up first. And I would say, no, you need to repent. You need to say mentally, I'm going to walk away. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean there's gonna, not going to be some challenges. But to say, I'm, I'm willing to walk away, then get baptized. It's, it's more of a starting line than a finish line. Let's, let's, 
let's go. Um, and, and you still may have questions, you know? Just because you're baptized doesn't mean you're perfect. No one is. Doesn't mean that you don't have some questions or concerns or things you're trying to f- think through. Yeah, let's, let's work on that stuff. And it doesn't mean that you're better than other people because you've done it. Um, Christians need to say, look, I'm not better than anybody. I'm just better than I used to be. And we compare ourselves to ourselves and see what God is doing in our lives. Now, I've done lots of baptisms at this church in the last almost 12 years. In the river, in different church buildings, in in the tub here at 2810, um, in swimming pools, just all over the place. And I've done a lot. I've seen other people in our church do baptisms. And really, like, it all boils down to some basic, simple stuff. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you think he was the son of God who lived and crucified, died for your sins, and rose from the dead? Are you willing to repent of your sin and walk away? The stuff that you're, it's on your radar and you're like, okay, this is a sin and I'm going to walk away. Are you willing to repent? And, and, and usually if people can say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good on those things, and we go, okay, what are you waiting for? Let's, let's get baptized. And then people uh, get baptized. And it's a, it's a powerful, powerful thing. For those of you who have been baptized, and that's a lot of people in our church, um, I want you to think of it this way. Uh, it is... Uh, baptism is more than just a symbol. And, and this is why I think it's going to be important for us right now in culture. Baptism is more than a, a, a symbol. A symbol is something that represents something else. So think of a wedding. A symbol is a wedding band. That's a symbol. The, the wedding band itself does not mean I'm married. People see it that way, but it really just represents on a certain day, I got married. Um, it's a symbol of that thing. A wedding ceremony itself is more like a sacrament. A sacrament is a sort of a dusty old religious word, um, but it's, it's helpful here. It's, it's sort of this religious ritual that where we actively express our faith. It, it, it's, it's something we do that means something greater than just the symbolic. So we have that in communion um, and we have it in baptism. When we are baptized, there's something going on there that's more than just Symbolic. It's more like the wedding ceremony. Baptism is more like a wedding ceremony. During a wedding ceremony, that is when you get married, right? Baptism is more like that than just wearing a ring as a symbol. Uh, the apostle, apostle Peter, in First Peter chapter three, uh, he writes. He wrote about this later in his life. So he gave that first sermon, and later in his life, he writes about the meaning of baptism. Listen to this. This is key. First Peter chapter three, verse twenty. He's talking about people in the time of Noah and the ark. He says, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter starts by talking about Noah and saying, hey, remember that thing that happened, that, that Noah and his family were saved in the ark, they got into the ark, they were saved, and, they, and water cleansed the earth. God's like, I'm going to wipe out the evil on the earth through water. This is similar to baptism now. We enter into that water, and our sins are washed away, and, and we, are, we are saved. And he makes a point of saying, it's not just getting wet. It's not physically just baptism. He says, it's not the removal of dirt from the body. It's not that you go into a tub, the dirt comes off of you, and you are now actually clean before God. He says, no, it is a, when you're baptized, it's a step of faith. It's a pledge of, of uh, an appeal to God for a good conscience. If in, in another way of looking at it is, this is how you, baptism is how you pray to God and ask him to save you. You are appealing to him and saying, God, please make me right. That's what happens when we, when we are baptized, when we enter into those waters in faith. Uh, we, we appeal to God and, and he cleanses us. If you have been baptized, I want to challenge you now to think back to when you were baptized. Think back to that day, that moment. Maybe it was this past year. Maybe it's five years ago, maybe decades ago. Think about where you were in that tub, in that river, in that lake, in that pool. Think about what was said the day you were baptized. Um, it's, it's a powerful thing. And, and, and when you were baptized, um, it wasn't just you saying, I'm going to follow God. It wasn't just you writing that down somewhere. It was you taking action. And through your actions, you said, 
I'm in on this. It was a very powerful thing. Think back to that because that day you were made something new. Something new changed inside of you. God did something there and and, and something shifted inside of you. And I think this is really important. You were made into, you were made a, a adopted into the family of God. You were made a member of God's family. You were given a new di- identity. You were given a new creation. And I think this is really important to remember right now because as I see it, the number one challenge in our culture right now is wrapped up in identity. And it has been for a, quite a while. We have been talking about identity in this culture for a long time, and it is the stumbling block. It is the issue that people are coming back to, where people are coming back and going, who am I and who gets to decide who I am? And we've had this stuff uh, around identity in our culture, around sexuality and, and gender. Uh, we've, ha- we've, we've had those conversations around identity. We're having those conversations around race right now and saying, am I this first and foremost? And all of these things are kind of wrapped up in that, and it is the key issue of our time. And the message from our culture culture is loud and it's persuasive and it has great commercials and funny memes and and great music around it saying like this is who you are and you get to decide like our culture is super loud about identity and when we are baptized into Christ we are saying I'm not who everyone says I am I am first and foremost a child of God I am not white black you know, or, or any color, I am not first and foremost that. I am not first and foremost single or married or a dad or a child or any, any of these things. I am not all of these labels. All of that stuff gets moved aside. I am primarily a child of God. This is what happens when you get baptized. Your identity is set. Your heavenly father sees you and knows you. And, you're, and, and when you're baptized into him, you're saying, I am yours And my primary identity is I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. You say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. It's Christ that lives in me. You and I were not crucified with Christ. We were not hanging on the cross that day. But the scripture teaches us in Romans 6 that the way we are crucified with Christ is to get baptized into him. And when that happens, it's not us anymore in here. It's Christ living through us. That's important to remember because right now the culture is grasping at straws to try to sort this out. We are trying to build a new future on basically no foundation, and and that's going to be a problem. The people of God, and and, and I'm not a big like America so awful and this country so awful. My concern and my heart is for the people of God, and that's probably you if you're you're listening, right? Um, The concern is the people of God need to stay close to the words of God, especially now, especially with how loud the voices are around us, how much social media and and media outlets scream at us. We have to stay close to the word of God. That's why I talked about it. Why I talked about scripture last week. It matters because the culture is going nuts and we need to build our lives on a different foundation than what the culture is doing. So if you haven't been baptized What are you waiting for? Let's go. We can do this. And it'll be a a powerful thing, a powerful initiation into the kingdom of God for you. And if you have been baptized, remember you have a different identity now than the culture around you. And let's live into that first. We're going to take communion now. We're going to, the band's going to lead us in a worship song. We'll do communion. And then... um, I want to, uh, and then uh, I'm going to come back and, and answer any questions you might have. And I got a couple things to announce that you don't want to miss. We have something going on today that you really, I really want you to be a part of. Uh, so I'll announce a couple things and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So if you've got any sort of elements to remember the body and blood of Christ, uh, bread and juice or something else that can substitute for that in your home right now, we can take those together during this, take, take it during this song as we sing and sing with us. Um, and then I'll wrap it up with a few things. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for baptism, that there's a way that we can phys- get physical and not just say it in our head or in our hearts, or, uh, but we can actually take action with what you've called us to. God, may we, if we have not been baptized, may people step forward in courage and say, I want to be baptized. I want to do this right. Um, and if we have been baptized, Lord, may we remember that baptism today and remember that that is, um, was part of our initiation into the kingdom of God and help us to live as kingdom people with that kingdom identity. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Uh, thank you for joining us. Let me just say happy Father's Day to the dads out there, uh, blessed by, uh, by you and, and how you've engaged in your children's lives, and I hope you have an awesome day, and this, this is a good celebration. I hope you get um, steak and baked potatoes today, which is what I'm getting. It's like a requirement on Father's Day, so I hope you have a, a great day. Uh, let, me, let me update you about a couple things that are happening that you need to know, and then let me answer one question, and then we will roll out of here, okay? So, Important stuff that's happening. Um, summer of Fun kicks off today at Area 10. Every summer we do fun events throughout the summer, hiking and you know fishing or bicycle stuff or board game nights and all sorts of stuff. We do these different events throughout the summer. We do a10summerfun.com. You can go there and look at what's coming up. That stuff kicks off today. It, it's happening. And to kick it all off, we are going to do uh, an event here at 2810 today from 1 to 4. So whatever you're doing now, Get ready to come out. 
probably involves, I don't know, shower or something, and, and come out uh, to our property here in Carytown at 2810 at one o'clock between one and four, we, we will have it set up for an outdoor party, a summer fun kickoff, like a car hop thing where you pull up, we will give you uh, free hot dogs and chips and drinks. We're going to do that today, uh, and it's going to be a little celebration here. We haven't, seen, we haven't seen some of you in a while. We'd love to see you out here. Bring a friend. We will give you free food, and uh, we'll have people here ready to pray for you as well if you want us to pray for you as you come by. Uh, that will be awesome, um, and we're going we're gonna to do that today. So come out today. I'd love to see you anytime today between 1 and 4 o'clock. It's going um, uh, uh, to be a lot of fun. Also, um, uh, the, uh, the summer of fun, there's some other things that are coming up as well throughout the summer. We are studying Bible studies through the book of Genesis. These are fantastic. We did it last God of Creation. We're doing that one and God of Covenant. We're doing a study uh, on women, women in the Bible. We're doing a study in the screw tape letters. That stuff starts this week. Sign up for that. Come here, get to see some people again, wear a mask, whatever. Like it, it's going to be fine. We, we are set up and ready to go. Uh, it's going to be a great thing. So you can do those this week. Sign up for one of those. The transformation class that I teach to help people get unstuck, that starts tomorrow night. You can come be part of that. We're doing a class called Adulting 101 to help people with some different life skill stuff that'll be really helpful for you. Um, look for all of that stuff. Uh, on, our, on our website or in the app and sign up and join us this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then I want to update you about the Unstoppable campaign because we said a couple weeks ago, in order to go back to the bird, we're raising money to buy a lot of equipment that we weren't counting on so that when we get back in the bird, we can continue to live stream. And we're going to get some stuff for children's ministry and redo our signage and all that. Um, uh, we, ha we, we set a goal to raise 20000 through the course of this unstoppable series. So for the next few weeks still, and I just wanted to update you at, at this point, we're at 15,475, which is super awesome. And I want to thank those of you who have given towards that. Uh, it's really cool to see. Let's finish it out and we should be good to go for when we start meeting back in the bird. When are we going to start meeting back in the bird? There's still a lot that's going into that and we're working on that. I have been in touch with the bird uh, this, this past week and we're working together on the plan and, and getting that together. Um, there's all sorts of things kind of happening with that, with their, with their sanitization stuff. The parking deck that we usually use is not open right now couple things going on there that we're working through, but we're excited about it. We're making plans. I will let you know more on that as, as soon as I can about what coming back together will look like it and how soon we can do it. So um, that's it. Lots of good stuff. One more question was asked. Um, somebody asked a question that I answered during the sermon, but this one was uh, a question about baptism. I was baptized at a young age by choice, but the question whether I truly understood the significance at the time, should I get baptized again? Um, that's one of those gray areas, right? Um, I, I would say there are those of us who are as adults who don't understand the significance of our baptism when, when we do it. We don't realize all of what God has for us there. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say in your case, whoever wrote this, I would not say that you necessarily need to get baptized again. Um, I, I guess I would put that in your, in your corner, like if you want to, we can, we can talk about that. Uh, you just sort of want to talk it through and think it through. Um, I wouldn't say it's a, a, like a, in, in the category of like necessity, like, oh, I should definitely get baptized um, again. Um, yeah, but that's, that's tricky because like my children were baptized, but we, uh, with kids, and if you've had these conversations in your home, my kids were, have been baptized, but they asked for a long time and we kept talking to them about it over, over a period of a couple of years and then they were baptized. But did they know everything they were going to know or were they ready or what? I, I don't know. Like there's still a lot more on this journey of faith that continues for us until we die. So um, anyway, so that, that's that. Uh, thanks for being with us today and worshiping with us. And I hope to see a whole bunch of you today. Uh, come on out to Carytown from one to four and uh, we will have a hot dog. We will give you a socially distanced high five or whatever we're supposed to do. And uh, it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. So uh, thanks for being with us. Let me pray and then we'll wrap up here. Father God, you are good to us. Um, and we thank you for being a good father. God, there are those of us who did not have a good earthly father. And, and so sometimes this day can be painful for us. But we know that you are the good father, that you love us, that you care for us and that you uh, model relationship for us in a, in a whole new way. God, help us to remember that. Help us to remember our, our primary identity as your children and really live into that. Um, thank you, Lord. May we uh, celebrate today and uh, the kickoff to this summer. And um, may, uh, may you use us to, to work for 
the kingdom here in, in this world with the time we have on earth. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go in peace.